our guest tonight, our speaker, is Dr. Robert Carter. And Dr. Carter's been here a couple times before, but we're so thrilled to have him back. He does a wonderful job every time he's here. Um, just a little bit about Dr. Carter. Uh, he obtained his Bachelor of Science in Applied Biology from Georgia Institute of Technology in 1992. Uh, he spent four years teaching high school biology, chemistry, uh, physics, and electronics before going to the University of Miami to obtain his PhD in marine biology. And he successfully completed this program in 2003 with a, a dissertation on cnidarian, sorry, oh, uh, genetics or uh, pigmentation in corals and other invertebrates. Uh, he designed and built an, an aquaculture facility for Caribbean corals, performed well over 500 scuba dives, many of them at night, and licensed a spin-off product of his research, uh, patented floral, or fluorescent protein to a biotech company. But he's currently a senior scientist and speaker at Creation Ministries International in Atlanta, Georgia, and he's currently researching human genetics and other issues related to biblical creation. So please welcome Dr. Carter. Thank you. Wow, I am surprised. We, um, I speak at a, oh, um, where's my talk? Minimize yours. There, okay. okay, here we go. I speak at a lot of creation groups around the country, and uh, most creation groups start off real strong, and then they kind of taper. So seeing a strong group like this with all these people, um, actually it, it makes me smile because <laughs> it doesn't happen often. For some reason I started in the There we go. Um, my talk for tonight is, what is it? Historical Adam, no, theological no, no, no. conundrums and something like that. I've actually turned this into seven reasons to believe in the biblical Adam. Being that I have a background in genetics, most of my points are going to be about genetics. And since Adam is our genetic ancestor. In fact, he's the single ancestor of everyone on the planet, including Eve. Um, there should be some genetic evidence for that. Hopefully, we'll see some as we go. A little bit about Creation Ministries International, because I'm assuming that there's some people here who are not very familiar with us. Here. I don't know. I'm just trying to get in a place where people can see. Um, we are 45 years old or something like that. I mean, it's decades before I came to work for them. I've worked for them for 15 years. Now, this organization is, they produce things like Creation Magazine, which I think is a tool that God used to keep me inside Christianity when I was 18 and 19 years old. And this is a long time before I came to work for them. I can't believe I get to work for them. But Creation Magazine, uh, creation.com is their website. I just wrote an article, and the article number is 15,000 something. So we literally have thousands of articles on our website, and you can read until your dying breath and probably not read everything we've ever written on the subject. <laughs> Decades of collective wisdom, and it's there for you. I know we're not going to answer every question that you have. I'm hopefully going to not go too long because I want time for questions from you. Uh, but even then, we're not going to answer them all, and so go to creation.com, and your answers will uh, be answered more fully then. We also produce things like um, our email newsletter comes out every Friday. We'll identify something new in the world of science, something that the world's talking about right now. Like, I don't know, did you hear a couple of weeks ago, they had this, um, these scientists, they calculated a family tree of everyone in the world. Yeah, well, I wrote an article on that, and it's going to be up on our website, and I think it's going to be on this Friday, maybe tomorrow, our info bite, because we try to say, this is a hot topic, let's get an article up there, and then we send it to everyone so they have an answer. If you'd like to get this and you're not, we're going to hand this out while I'm speaking. We ask for a name, an email address, and a zip code. And the zip code is only there because every time we send a speaker out on the road, we'll email everyone with a certain radius. Say, hey, come on, and bring your friends. And everywhere I go, I'm running to people that came because of this little announcement that they got. So that's there. Uh, yes, volunteer lady. Kim. Lisa Kim. Linda Kim. 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 I knew it was short. <laughs> Kim's going to be handing these out. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to just talk while that's happening. My background is in marine biology. In fact, my background is in coral reef ecology. But after several years in the coral reef world, I ended up in the genetics lab. 
I was studying these pigments on these animals, these beautiful corals, the greens, the yellows, the reds, the oranges, and I was trying to figure out what they were, and I was doing all these chemical extractions, and none of them were working, because it's not a chemical. It turns out, these are proteins. This is bizarre, because you're made of protein, and you don't glow under ultraviolet light. <laughs> but these animals do. In fact, I went into our, um, our museum at the University of Miami, and I asked Nancy, the lady there, I said, Nancy, do we have any deep water corals? She goes, oh yes, we dug some up two miles down in the 1930s. They're here in this pickle jar. <laughs> and I look at the pickle jar, the alcohol was green. So I took some of the alcohol out and I put it in my spectrophotometer, the same exact spectrum. So deep water corals, shallow corals, jellyfish, all sorts of cnidarians, things with stinging cells, have these fluorescent proteins and no one knows why. I did an entire dissertation on this and I don't know why they're there. But I ended up studying the proteins that have genes behind them and I realized there's a gene. I said, oh, I can get that gene. And when I stole the genes from these animals and engineered them into those animals, that's when I got my doctorate. So my doctorate ended up being in genetic engineering. And that opens up a giant can of worms, which is another lecture for another day. <laughs> I'm actually preparing my first ever genetic engineering talk for our Creation Super Conference, which will be uh, Memorial Day week in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina this coming May. We do have a couple spots left, just saying that if you want to hear talk about genetic engineering. But the interesting thing for me about genetics is genetics is basically the study of how DNA is passed from one generation to the next. So it's a science of history. And as a Christian, I'm reading the Bible, and the Bible claims to be a book of history. <coughs> and I know that geneticists are building tools to test different theories of history. Well, that means that we can use genetics to test the Bible, which is a very scary proposition. Scary because, first of all, the odds are against us. I mean, evolutionists think they have everything nailed down. They think that, you know, Y chromosome Adam evolved in the deepest, darkest Africa about two or three hundred thousand years ago. That does not sound like the biblical proposition, does it? And yet, if we put our thinking caps on and we get our jots and tittles lined up correctly and we think through these issues properly, I do believe there's a lot of excellent evidence to support the biblical narrative of human history. And it's surprising. And the funny thing is the evolutionists found it. And all I got to do is tell you what they learned. And like, that's Bible, that's Bible, that's Bible, and that's Bible too. Looking at the Bible, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. The Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. You've all read that, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you haven't, I would encourage you, open up your Bible to the first page. Second page, <laughs> third page. This is the creation account, first couple of chapters in Genesis. God created the entire universe. But this is a very interesting passage here because the Bible directly contradicts evolutionary theory. There is no common ancestry between man and any other species, according to this. In fact, man is different than all the other animals. Everything else God spoke into existence. Let it happen, let this produce, let this be, and things just happen. When it came to the creation of human beings, he stopped. He manufactured humans out of dirt, especially, and then breathed into their nostrils the breath of life. We have a spirit, we have a certain je ne sais quoi, something different, something immeasurable, something intangible that separates us from every animal species, period. Dolphins might be real smart, they can't do calculus. Chimpanzees, they're very highly intelligent animals, but we flew to the moon and they're still in the rainforest. They don't have poetry, they have no concept of music, literally. They've tested this. They have no concept of music at all. Humans are very different. We're created to relate to our creator in a very special way. But it's not just men. It's also women. In Genesis chapter 2, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. While he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up his place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made it into a woman. I hope you've all read that before. And I hope you're not Lamarckians who think that men have one less rib than women. That's not true. 
I mean, if you lose your finger in an accident, your children are going to be born with 10 fingers because of genetics, right? You know that, right? Okay, good. Plus, uh, the rib bone is a one body, the bone in the body that if you take it out carefully and leave the, 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 the mesentery around it, it will regrow. And uh, surgeons use this all the time. In fact, I learned this from Dr. Carl Whelan, who is the founder of Creation Ministries International, who was in a head-on car accident out in the Australian outback and had no face. And as their doctors are reconstructing his face and going into the third or fourth surgery, knowing they're going to take the rib bone out, and he quipped to the doctor. He's a medical doctor himself. He quipped to the doctor, oh, there must not be much of that bone left. He goes, don't you know we take the whole thing out every time? Oh, so neat. Huh. Okay. We've established a biblical precedent. One man, from that man, one woman. The Bible claims that that's it. No, there are not people outside the garden. No, nope. Cain got his wife from one of his relatives. He was worried about his relatives killing him after he killed his brother. Because all we know from creation, I'm getting off topic here, I wrote an article about this, uh, when did Cain kill Abel? Uh, all we know is that between creation and 130 years later, when Seth was born, this is when Cain killed his brother Abel. They could have been great-great-grandparents by this point in time. A lot of people could have been on earth. Just saying. Look it up on creation.com if you want. Um, my point is, I'm trying to get to theology here. I do understand that my position that I hold is not um, even remotely popular in almost every theological seminary in the world. Not even close. I also know that within the Christian community, my position is usually scoffed at. Take uh, Dr. Francis Collum, very famous man. He just retired from being the director of the National Institutes of Health. The COVID pandemic kind of wore him down. He said, I'm done with this. And, um, he's, he was there for a long time. He's an evangelical Christian, by profession anyway. I'm not going to doubt that. And yet he started an organization called BioLogos. And they've taken it off their website, but their first website it said very clearly that one of their goals is to contradict that young earth creationism. Mm -hmm. You know that adage with friends like that? Yeah. Well, um, Christianity Today reviewed his book, The Search for the Historical Adam. They said this, Collins' 2006 bestseller, The Language of God, a scientist presents, I'm sorry, the article is called The Search for the Historical Adam. His book is The Language of God, a scientist presents evidence for belief. Okay, I want to pause for a second. You're about to hear a Christian who's a scientist give you evidence for why he believes the Bible. What do you think the next words coming out of his mouth should be? Well, he reported scientific indications that anatomically modern humans emerged from primate ancestors? Perhaps 100,000 years ago, long before the Genesis time frame. Originally, the population number was something like 10,000, not two individuals. What are those numbers? What is it, 100,000? What's that? What is a 10,000? What is that? That's the out of Africa theory of human origins. <laughs> this is an after the fact theory. Once they discovered mitochondrial leaves, they said, oh no, there's only one woman who's the ancestor of everyone in the world today? That's not supposed to be true. Oh, 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 oh. but, but, if we went through a population bottleneck where only a few people were alive for a very long time, at random, most of the family lines are just going to disappear. Just at random. Like, if we were, like, let's say a plague happens and everyone outside this room dies. And we leave here and we realize we're the only people in the world and we have to restart the world population. Every man that doesn't have a son, is going, his Y chromosome will disappear forever. Every woman who doesn't have a daughter, her mitochondria will disappear forever. It will only take a couple of generations between, before there's only one Y chromosome and one mitochondria in the entire future human population. It happens in small populations. If they grow fast, that doesn't happen. If they stay small for a long time, that's a bottleneck. The African bottleneck no one, I've never heard anybody say it lasted for so long. 
And the reason they don't say that is because they know bottlenecks are bad. There are about 10,000, they think about 10,000 humans in the world at one point in time, for a long time. There are about 10,000 cheetahs in the world right now, and everyone knows cheetahs are going to go extinct. Birth defects are increasing, litter size is decreasing, all these reproductive incompatibilities. Cheetahs are in big trouble because there's only about 10,000 of them in the world. By the way, that's my answer for why Bigfoot doesn't exist. You can't have a large vertebrate species without a lot of pro large population. It's impossible. That number. I have a little laser pointer here. I'm going to turn that on. That number is catastrophic genetically, but the evolutionist has to appeal to it to get rid of all the other lineages that should have been in the early human population until the point where we only get one. Sir? Um, it's catastrophic because all the mutations that have already uh, accumulated? Because every new mutation now has a very high frequency. Right now, if I carry a mutation no one else in the world has, that's one out of seven billion. That's a tiny percent. But if I was only one out of 10,000 people, that's a much higher percent. And over time, since everyone is, is adding more mutations to the population every generation, over time, the mutation load is going to build up until extinction is guaranteed. I guess what yeah. I'm coming up with is, okay, animals got off the ark, people got off the ark, there were very few. Yes. Fewer than 10,000. Yes. So that's... But we rapidly expanded. Okay. A population bottleneck. The whole population in the world goes reduced to two people, and those people had lots of children, they had lots of children, they had lots of children, it wouldn't have any effect at all. It's the length of the bottleneck that's current. Sir? Isn't, isn't there genetically about 100 to 150 um, defects that happen within from generation yep. to generation? Yep. Get to that. Hold on. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> William Lane Craig. Yes. I uh, just came out with uh, his book finally. He's been studying anatomy for some years. Comes out with this book. And, uh, well, Bill Craig's a good guy. Otherwise, he's um, a Christian apologist. He's done a lot of things that have helped me. His ministry is in Atlanta, right near CMI. He's not, you know, he's almost a neighbor. Twenty minutes away, maybe. But he's always believed in deep time evolution. And he was in the debate with this atheist named Frank Zimmer. He ran a big uh, atheist organization here in America. This is way back in 1996. And Zimmer, the atheist, said this in the middle of his debate. He said, knowing that Bill Craig believes in evolution, he says, if there never was an Adam and Eve, there never was an original sin. If there never was an original sin, then there's no need of salvation. If there's no need of salvation, there's no need of a savior. And I submit that puts Jesus, historical or otherwise, into the ranks of the unemployed. I think that evolution is absolutely the death knell of Christianity. You got that formula? You get rid of the first Adam, there's no reason for the last Adam. Charles, Charles Darwin and his friends knew that formula. They wrote that in their letters to each other. We knew from the beginning of evolutionary theory that this is a direct attack on the historicity and the understandability and the, the authenticity of the Bible. If that Adam isn't true, there's no need for Jesus at all. And I wonder, theologians, sorry, the liberal side of Christian theology, I've never heard anyone give me a cohesive answer to that challenge. The things they say are usually pretty sad, and they usually have excellent arguments, and they go over here and make really bad arguments. They don't even use the same thought process they use for other things. And I don't know why, but it's true. Okay, it took too long to get my first point. I'm about to give you seven reasons to believe in the biblical Adam. So we don't have to do all that exegetical leapfrogging that some people have to resort to when they're struggling to explain Adam and don't believe Adam. My first bit of evidence is not really genetic, it's just population growth. It is easy to explain seven and a half billion people, starting from six people that came off the ark 4,500 years ago. Mm -hmm. This is a growth curve. I got this from the uh, U.S. Census Bureau, using lots of measures, lots of archaeology, uh, looking at uh, the human population over time and how it has grown recently. Now, the recent numbers are accurate. There's a lot of assumptions and estimates here, but all of this in the beginning, that just make believe. That's just a giant assumption about our population size. 
the bodies aren't there. I mean, before that bottleneck, and even after that bottleneck, let's say, like, you know, across the world, maybe there's a million people throughout these, these millennia. Well, a million people, their average lifespan might be 30 or 40 years. That means every 30 or 40 years, there's a million new bodies. That's a billion, maybe even a trillion bodies that never existed because there's no evidence for them. Instead, if you just start with Noah, Noah's children, his sons and their wives, six starting people, and double that population every 150 years, which is ridiculously slow, you get to 7 billion people today. Ridiculously slow. I have four children. My wife and I doubled our population one generation. Populations grow much faster than doubling every 150 years, except war, starvation, and disease. Mm -hmm. That's the only reason why there aren't a gazillion people on Earth today. War, starvation, in fact, most people in human history probably had PTSD, because almost every society was a war society, and there'd be a population explosion, and all the young people would go and do a war. And if they lost, they're all dead. And if they won, the other guys are all dead. The amount of murder in human history is shocking. And the things happening right now in the Ukraine, I just read a book called um, In the Midst of Civilized Europe. It's the history of the Jewish persecutions in the Ukraine between the two big uh, world wars. Hundreds of thousands of murdered and raped Jews. This is typical. So what's happening with Russia right now, that's the same thing the Russians have always done, and the Ukrainians always did, and the Germans always did, and the Scotch always did. People have been really bad. Sorry, I'm getting off, get off my hobby horse here. <laughs> okay, so reason number one to believe in Adam is uh, population growth fits biblical time frame. Lovely. Number two, there's a general lack of diversity on that Y chromosome. It's pretty easy to start with one man and explain every man on the planet. From me to the man furthest away from me, in fact, I'm, I'm over here, I'm group R1B, 80% of Western European men belong to this group. This is a family tree that I made uh, from the Simons Genome Diversity Project. They looked at um, 600 something men from around the world and they sequenced their entire genome. And I pulled the Y chromosome data and I used an evolutionary tree building program, a long time to do this, to make this tree. We're going to get back to this a couple of times because there's some amazing things in here. But I'm somewhere over here. From me to the person the furthest away from me. This would be uh, the pygmies living in the African rainforest. A, this A group, this would be the Khoisan Bushmen living in the Kalahari Desert. There's only a few hundred mutations separating us. You can count up the mutation rate from father to son to son to son. Modern genetics, we can do that. We've done that. We've tried real hard. What is the actual mutation rate? It's about one or two per generation. Oh, um, that puts us on a biblical time scale. Why chromosome Adam is not hundreds of thousands of years ago. He's thousands of years ago. Just using a normal, measurable mutation rate. I'm very comfortable with that. What that means, since there hasn't been that long, there's not much difference between one man and another. Not much at all. We're shockingly similar. In fact, if um, I'm going to put some rings here. Um, so what was this? Ah, the outer ring, that's most of the guys in the world. There's a couple of people who are in strange outlying populations with very small population sizes. They're outliers. But everyone else in the world fits within that circle. If that is Noah's family, Noah is somewhere near the middle. I can't say exactly where because mutations are random. And Noah's a really old man when he has his Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And old men pass a lot of mutations to their children. In fact, the older the man gets when they have a child, the more mutations they give to their kid. We can measure that in the laboratory also. That means that Shem, Ham, and Japheth are here. Noah's here somewhere. Uh, these are like the patriarchs mentioned in Genesis 11. Wow. The number of families, the distance between them, the 
fact that everyone goes back to one person somewhere in the middle of this group. By the way, that explosion, that is a signal of a rapidly growing population. Because like uh, group O here, these are men from China, Japan, Korea. And you look at that, it's a beautiful fan. That is a population that has just grown and grown and grown and grown and grown. Because in a growing population, you have a, any man has a higher likelihood of having a son, who has a higher likelihood of having another son, because the population is growing. There's a lot of extra kids. So any mutation that happens, which forms a new branch in the family tree, is more likely to be passed on. But in small populations, you get spindly family trees. They're leggy, they're branchy, there's a lot of distance between them. This is a signal of a tiny population. That's a signal of a big, growing population. I'm gonna throw something at you here. Um, let me say this. I'm gonna say it. Ah. Imagine that we're the Babel population. And we're about this size, we decide to build this big money into our stupidity, and God's gonna come down and he's gonna spread us out. And let's say we're all of our kids and grandkids are here also. Okay, so all of our families are here. Maybe there's about a thousand people. Based on the size of the room, I say we probably have about a thousand relatives like that. When God separates the languages, well, you know what? Some of our families have intermarried. Some of our sons have married someone else's daughter. And because of that tangled intermarriage, when we separate, the mitochondria are going to be mixed up everywhere. God's going to separate us according to male ancestry because the patriarchal lineage is that God separates. So the female lines are going to be randomly scrambled. That would mean that over in that population, you know, maybe Thelma had six grandkids, and one of them ends up in Africa, one of them ends up in, in Asia, one of them ends up in Iceland. So each of the ladies, your kids, your grandkids, and great, they're going to be spread out around the world. Does that make sense? Okay. This is what I'm trying to say. If we were a population six million years ago in Africa, and that population split to form humans and chimpanzees. There should have been a diversity of lineages in that original population. And when we split, it should be possible to find lineage 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 in both humans and chimpanzees. That would mean that individual 1 in human is more closely related to a chimpanzee than to any other human. Because you have to count up the length of the line. So human to number two is one, two, three, four steps. But human to chimpanzee one is only two steps. Does that make sense? This is, a, this is only the second time I've ever tried to explain this in public. I'm trying to do it a little different. <clears throat> this is shockingly scary. Because imagine if that was an African lineage. And some African men shared a Y chromosome with chimpanzees, and they didn't share the Y chromosome with other humans. Could you imagine the social ramifications of something like that? Sure. You're more of a monkey than me. Yeah. Ooh. Well, happily, God didn't allow that to happen. This is reality. This is the evolutionary reality. The human Y chromosome, the chimp Y chromosome, they're radically different from one another. I mean, amazingly, the same is true for the mitochondria. I've lined up by eye tens of thousands of human mitochondria. Once you get the starting point, whoosh, it lines up easy. You just got to add a couple little spaces here and there to keep them lined up. I, I can't do the chimpanzee by eye. A computer algorithm can do it. But I'm literally looking at this like, I, I had no idea. Can't do it. I've lined up thousands of, of um, coronavirus, uh, SARS-CoV-2 genome. By eye, just vroom, vroom, all the A's, all the T's, okay, and they're lined up, it's easy. I cannot do it with human mitochondria or my artificial human Y chromosomes, because most of the Y chromosome is exactly the same amongst everyone, every male. So you can get rid of all the letters that are the same and condense them down. You have about 65,000 letters out of 60 million that vary. And you can line that up by eye, easy, can't do it with you. My point is this, 
chimpanzee rat, uh, Y chromosome, chimpanzee mitochondria are radically different than humans. That is not what the evolution has predicted. In fact, that could have been the evolutionary scenario. It's not. This is their scenario. I don't believe that this part exists at all. But that's a long story. We're getting there. We okay with that? Man. Just to clarify, you're saying that chimps to human cannot line up. Yes. So I'm assuming that chimp to chimp lines up. Yes. And, okay. Yes. Chimp to chimp, human to humans, okay. easy. I've done both of those. You can use a computer to do it. But a computer, just statistically, it'll find an alignment. It might not be true. But it, it'll, it'll align it like, you know, the A here, the next 100 letters, like, okay, here's a G that lines up also. And they'll just slide things around and add gaps and things. And <coughs> but, the, yeah, okay. Excuse me real quick. Yeah. The diagram on the right, uh, does that represent uh, the last, does that represent just one generation at that point? No, no, this is millions of years in the evolutionary model. Okay. So this is some gorilla-like ancestor, or human chimpanzee gorilla-like ancestor. This is the population of chimpanzee humans before we evolved into both species. And there's a diversity of Y chromosomes or mitochondria. And then for some reason, dumb luck, only one mitochondria or Y chromosome is in the chimpanzee species, and only one's in the human species. It didn't have to be like that. Okay. Just, okay. Thank you. I might drop that for my talk. I know that's complicated. Let's get to easier stuff. <laughs> Third reason why you can believe in the biblical atom. The fact that Y chromosome atom exists. Now, that is actually biblical ignorance. It should be called Y chromosome Noah. But we'll let the evolutionists who tongue-in-cheek were laughing at the Christian Bible when they came up with the phrase Y chromosome Adam. They also came up with the phrase mitochondrial Eve. That is not the biblical Eve in their model, but if I just take the mutation rate and say, you know, my mitochondrial Eve is about the same time that Eve existed biblically. On the right is a picture I've not shown you yet. I took this, uh, this is the 1,000 genomes data. I took the mitochondrial sequences and I made an evolutionary tree. And you can see again, an explosion. Same is true with the Y chromosome. We have evidence that both of these different things go back to a single person only a few thousand years ago. The fourth reason to believe in the biblical Adam is the amount of human genetic diversity, which is not that much. And yet, Francis Collins, at Pepperdine University. There's no way you can develop this level of variation between us from one or two ancestors. You know, when a guy who ran the Human Genome Project makes a statement like that, people believe him. Because if anyone in the world should know what he's talking about, it's that guy, right? Dennis Venema, a professor at um, that Christian college in uh, Canada. Uh, Trinity... Um, he's also on the board. He's also a member of BioLogos. He said, you'd have to postulate this is an astronomically, uh, absolutely astronomical mutation rate that has produced all these new variants in an incredibly short period of time. Those types of mutation rates are just not possible. It would mutate us out of existence. So if we started with Adam and Eve, how do we get black people, white people, Chinese people, Native Americans, tall people, short people, dark people, light people, blue eyes, blonde uh, uh, brown eyes, blonde hair, red hair. How do you get all that? Wouldn't it mutate us out of existence? Well, I answered this directly in an article on creation.com. The non-mythical Adam and Eve, where I showed easily, clearly, you can start with Adam and end up with all of us today. You don't even need Eve. Ready? Uh, you people are related, right? Okay. One, two... Three, if you're not related, four, five. That's 99% of the world's genetic diversity. Right there. You might need six people if you're from Iceland, maybe four if you pick random Africans. 
99% of world genetic diversity in a handful of people. And the genetic diversity here, if I pick a bunch of African people, people of African descent, it's the same diversity. They carry the same letters. There's about 30 million variants that are found in people across the planet. You yourself have about one third of the world's genetic diversity. There's about 10 million places in your genome where the copy you got from your mother disagrees with the copy you got from your father. If you lined up your two genomes, you have 30, about 10 million places where the, you have an A here and a G here, a C here and a T there. That's about a third of the world's genetic diversity just in you. Oh, well, if you have a third and you don't feel like you're a mutant, we can easily triple that. That's Adam. But most of the, the variants that are shared amongst us, they don't cause disease. They're good variants because they're created by God. It's the new variants that cause disease. Sickle cell anemia, hereditary blindness, tie socks, um, on and on and on. Tons, tons of disease-causing variants. They're new. Uh, hemophilia. Queen Victoria almost killed off the royal houses of Europe. With hemophilia, she had a bunch of kids, and they married in, I mean, Tsar Nicholas II, the last Tsar of Russia, his son was a hemophiliac. He was a great-grandson of Victoria. No one in the British royal family or any of the other extended royal families had hemophilia before Victoria. She had a brand new mutation that occurred in her only, not in her siblings, not anyone else. It's a new mutation. I've done a lot of statistical analyses. Um, in fact, the bottom of this article, there'll be links to my, some of my other articles. Um, one, I, I went with a friend of mine, and we, uh, no, this one I did my, by myself. I said, okay, I'm gonna take X number of people in the world, six people, from this group, from this group, from that group, and I'm gonna say, how much of genetic diversity do they have based on the world's genetic diversity? And any random six people, I said 99%, I should have said, have between 50 and 80% of the world's genetic diversity. It depends on how closely related they are. So Noah's sons married three girls. If those girls were random women from the human population, the ark would have carried about 80% of the pre-flood diversity. If they were all sisters, in fact, they could have been daughters of Noah. That's true, right? If the three brothers marry their three sisters, right. the ark, why? Because there was no, no law against it back then. There are no genetic mutations yet. Um, in fact, the law against marrying close cousins, wasn't, close kin, wasn't put into effect in the Bible until the time of Moses, like 1,500 years after the flood. But we saw it in Abraham. He married his half-sister. It took a miracle of God for them to have a child. Isaac married his first cousin once removed and first cousin twice removed, Rebecca, times two because of his two, yeah. Um, and Sounds so like West Virginia. One of their sons was hairy all over. He had wolf man gene, apparently. <laughs> and then their other son, Jacob, married his two first cousins, which were much closer to the first cousins because all three of them descended from all four of Terah's known children. Um, by the time you got down to the 12 tribes of Israel, um, they were incredibly inbred. Shockingly so. I keep using that word. I guess it's my theme for the evening. Shocking. Um, <laughs> my point is this, though. You can start with Adam and easily arrive at all the genetic diversity in the world today without any trouble at all. My locus is wrong. Fifth reason to believe in the biblical Adam is the distribution of the genetic variants. And I just said that there's about 30 million variants shared amongst all world populations. What's really strange, though, there is not a single letter in the African genome, or genomes of Africans, that is not found anywhere else in the world. Say that again. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it several times in several different ways. There is no single letter that you can use to absolutely identify someone from a specific race. By just looking at their genome. Yes, by just looking at their genome. I'm going to say it another way. There are a lot of variants that are found only in Iceland, only in Africa, only amongst Native Americans. 
fine, but they're not ever found in 100% of those people. Because we came from a single population that all their genes were shared, the sons of Shen, Ham, and Japheth had to marry the daughters of Shen, Ham, and Japheth. That's the only people alive, right? Mm -hmm. The cousins had to get married. But there wasn't anything that says, oh, 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 Shem, your children can only marry Shem. No. There's about five generations of complete random mixing. Our genes are completely spread out, and then God separates us into subpopulations at Babel, meaning each subpopulation got a really good representation of all the genes that were on the ark. Therefore, there's no letter that completely separates us. We're all the same. And then you add mutations. I used to have red hair. Oh, well. <laughs> red hair is only found in Scotland and Ireland. That's a mutation that happened in the early population after Babel. Because it's only in a few people in the world. Blue eyes is clearly isolated in Scandinavia. In fact, southern Scandinavia, northern Scandinavia, it was a belt across the middle of Sweden and Finland, uh, Sweden and Norway, that were the highest proportion of blue eyes in the world. In fact, if you look at a map of where blue eyes is found, it uh, actually mirrors the Viking invasions of the Middle Ages. <laughs> <laughs> Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin had blue eyes. Vikings conquered the moon. <laughs> <laughs> If we would look at this, is, I'm going to show you um, mitochondrial <coughs> data. Skipping over the things that everyone has in common, let's just look at variants that are only found in some people. <coughs> what we see is, yeah, there are some letters that are found in 20, 30, 40 percent of the population, but they're very rare. Those are things that would have had to have happened before Babel, or right after Babel, or some lucky person way back in history is the ancestor of some woman is the ancestor of 30% of the people in the world today. It's really hard to do. So, like, uh, my children didn't get my mitochondria. They got my wife's mitochondria. Um, she could easily have passed on a mutation to one of my children. The frequency of that mutation would be over here somewhere. Because of one person divided by the size of the human race. Very low frequency. Most all, in fact, I cut this off here. There, this, this would go up way past the roof of this building. Most all the variants are very rare, meaning they're very young. Mm. They haven't had time to spread out in the population, meaning our species is very young. And the distribution reflects that. Now, the evolutionists found this. They're like, okay. And they came with the bottleneck and the blah, blah, blah. But no, this is exactly what should be true given a biblical time frame, a biblical eve, and mutation accumulation, and a rapidly spreading population. Not to be outdone, though, we kept going. That black line is called the allele frequency distribution. That's the frequency of all the letters on chromosome 22 in a 1,000 Genomes Project. So about 2,000 people, I pulled their chromosome 22s, and I, I lined them up and I said, okay, letter number one, A. Letter number two, G. Le okay, oh, here's a, letter number three, some people have a C and some people have a T. How many people have a C? Three. How many people have a T? 2,052. Three divided by, but that gives me that. And then some of the letters are found in more people, but not many. The evolutionist wants to say, first they tried to say, you can't get that much diversity. The mutations will kill us all. That's not true. Then they said, oh, but the distribution of mutations is not what we would expect. Because think about this. If we started with Adam only, he has two copies of his chromosomes. It can be an A on one and a T on the other. That means that every variance is a 50-50. There are almost no variants at 50-50. Is the Bible wrong? If we start with Adam, can we get that? Yeah. Well, we have Eve also. Eve can't be a clone of Adam because she's a girl, but all God has to do is double her X chromosome. And X chromosomes do have less diversity than the other chromosomes, so maybe he just doubled his X, Adam's X chromosome. Um, but that still is 50-50 ratio. 
But what if Eve had her own genome? Then now we have four original copies of the original genome. There could be an A, an A, a T, and a T. That's 50-50. Or an A, a T, and a T, and a T. That would be 25-75. And we have two spikes. Well, I don't see a spike at 25 either. So we use this program called Mendel's Accountant. As far as I know, it's the most sophisticated evolutionary pro uh, program ever written. And it's written by creationists because we want to ask evolutionary questions. We've published multiple papers on this in the secular literature and in the creationist literature on population dynamics. But this one was from the International Conference on Creationism just a couple of years ago. That is chromosome 22 data in the real world. Now let's look at an evolutionary model where we have 100,000 people for 100,000 years. It's a normal mutation rate and people having children and this many children per female and this you know, average age of marriage and all that kind of stuff. You put all these in your computer model and we got that. That blue line is an evolutionary model, what we would expect over evolutionary time if every new mutation that happens has to spread out to everyone else. It takes a long time. And they all, every, any brand new mutation starts off by definition here at the very edge because it's one divided by the population size. So that looks, yeah. Since all the mutations start off at this end and they have to creep slowly to this end, you get that curve. Nothing started off over there. It looks like it matches the data, doesn't it? And I said, okay, and that's a biblical model. Let's just start with Adam and Eve. Let the population grow 1,500 years later. We're going to throw a bottleneck in there. The whole population is going to drop down to six people, three couples. And we'll let that bottleneck grow into a large population again. And we said, okay, let's do another one. Let's, let, um, let's do an evolutionary Adam and Eve, where we have evolution happening over a very long time. And we're going to take two people, kill off everyone else, and those two people are going to start off the human race again. We said, okay, but what if Eve did not have the same genome as Adam? We saw with four genomes. And what if Adam and Eve's reproductive cells each had a different genome? Why not? Why is God limited to just, uh, their body cells? He made ovaries and he made testes. He could fill those things up with any number of different genomes. So the amount of genetic diversity in the human population today depends upon how many children Adam and Eve had. So we ran all those other models. And we got this. Every one of the alternative models is a better fit to the real data than the evolutionary model. Even though, when we start with Adam, every variant starts at 50-50. That was cool. Now you're asking, how does this happen? Well, the answer is, sure, it starts off here, but but let's say Adam had, it's probably not true, the, a blue-eyed gene and a brown-eyed gene. Let's say Adam has 10 kids. Well, probably not true that half of his kids got the brown-eyed gene and half of his kids got the blue-eyed gene. It might be 64, 6 to 4, 7 to 3, 8 to 2. It might be that none of his children got one of those, and that gene was lost from the population forever. Now, it's not going to happen any given gene, but given a thousand or a million genetic variants, some of them are going to be lost. Some of the things got put into Adam are not in the human population today because of chance. But if you start off with 50-50, the next generation it might be 60-40. The next generation might be 30-70. The, the, that 50-50 peak goes bloop like that. That's this. That's Adam. And then you add new mutations over time that all start at this end. Is that over your head? Is that too much? Yeah, yeah you're tired of me talking now? <laughs> no. <laughs> Sir? Um, I was just wondering, if you're starting out with those genes and we're talking about Adam and Eve, Yes. okay, did Noah and his family, did they contain all of those genes down through history? Or by virtue of the fact that there was only those six people on the ark, did we lose some of those at that point? There are only six people on the ark. We had to lose some genetic diversity. Right. It guaranteed some. It depends on how closely related they are to each other, how much we lose. And it depends on how isolated they were from the rest of the world. 
if no one in his family for generations were holed up in some little valley of the rest of the world and killing themselves and murdering each other, they might have had generations of inbreeding. True. So we could have lost more genetic diversity. Right. Interesting questions. But there's still six people, and six people capture a lot of a population's history. Okay? The sixth reason to believe in a biblical Adam is the irregular nature of mutations. The evolutionists want to appeal to something called a molecular clock. And mutations happen in, the same, in all populations at the same rate across all of time and across all of geography. That is necessary, or you can't put a date on the human chimpanzee split. You can't put a date on mitochondrial Eve or Y chromosome Adam. You need a molecular clock or they have nothing to talk about. The reason mitochondrial Eve is here on this African-only branch is because from this point here to the most distant point over here, the halfway point is about there. <coughs> the reason why chromosome Adam is on an African branch is because that is the halfway point between these people and these people over here. And that's on an African branch. It's the assumption of a molecular clock. That's why Adam and Eve are in Africa in their models. But wait a second. Look really carefully. You see this guy up here? Yeah. You see this guy over here? You see these people over here? These people are cousins of these people. Maybe not cousins. I mean, they maybe go back. They go back to a common ancestor maybe a thousand years ago. I don't know. Some number there. But over because all these people in this branch came from the same founder, a single man, and yet some people have more mutations than others. There's no molecular clock. Look over here. Uh, HVR, I am group H, I'm H16, very rare in Europe, but uh, about 80%, just like the R1B in, in Y chromosomes, about 80% of Western Europeans are somewhere in group H. Okay, but look, that's the ancestress of this population, right there. Can you see where all those lines come together? Mm -hmm. That is a female that lived in history who gave birth to 80% of Europe <laughs> and a huge chunk of India and Central Asia. That is a massive founder who is um, the ancestor. I mean, this person over here, um, uh, this is uh, China again, this area. There's one woman who is the ancestress of most of the eastern half of the world. <clears throat> That's cool. Okay, my point is this. From this lady, the length of these sticks is the number of mutations. Uh-oh. These people are twice as mutant as those people over the same amount of time. It's obvious. It's easy to see. And since I know that's true, I don't know that these are older populations. And being that these are oddball populations, small groups with lots of inbreeding. Why would I, you know, when you're doing science, you, usually you, you isolate your outliers. If you have an outlier, there are scientific reasons to just delete it from your data. Oh, I hiccup when I'm doing that measurement. <laughs> what do you know, so I got to scale them. Whatever, there's reasons why some measurements are just bad measurements. And you, you can easily, and you average everything else and do study on the things that make sense. Scientists do that all the time. The entire out of Africa theory is based on the outliers. That makes me very uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Wow. There's something else happening here, though. I said earlier, um, the older a man is, the more mutations he passes on to his children. That's because at puberty, the man's reproductive cells start dividing, and they don't stop dividing until the man dies. It's not true in females. When a woman is um, when, when an embryo, when, when a fertilization event produces a female embryo, 20 cell divisions later, her ovaries are finished. And the eggs are in the ovary. And they're held in protective custody for sometimes 45 years before ovulation. Non-dividing. Now there are some issues with uh, older eggs. They tend to have chromosomal problems like Down syndrome and things like that. But 
women don't pass many mutations to their children. It's only 20 cell divisions. A man, it's 30 something, so maybe 32 cell divisions before the testes are ready to go, and in puberty, they start to divide. And it gets worse and worse and worse, more and more chromosomal replications. Those little machines that copy the DNA, they're amazing. They only make a mistake about every billion letters. They have to copy six billion letters. <laughs> Something I call patriarchal drive. I wrote a paper about this in the Journal of Creation. I, I love modeling populations. I have a, it's not my laptop, my laptop's over there, but on my laptop, I have a population model that I've used in a lot of different papers, and I keep on modifying and changing it. And this one, I modified it to track an estimate of the number of chromosomal replications in each male. And I use that as a proxy on mutation rate. And this is the post-flood population. Starting off Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and they have children, they have children, they have children. We know, according to the Bible, that they lived a long time. Well, Noah was over 500 years old when he had Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Noah would have been genetic poisoned to the post-flood population. He's older than any other man in the Bible, by far. Shem, Ham, and Japheth, we know how old their sons are when they're born in Genesis 11. But it's probably not their first son. It's definitely not their last son, or the population would die. And because these guys would have been chieftains, they would have been leaders, they would have been elevated to God status. <laughs> Imagine that. Their children also, they would have been the kings and the princes, and they would have been held in highest esteem. In fact, I have a friend, he's actually a descendant of Muhammad. When he goes home to Iraq, people bow to him. That guy is held in high esteem, and Muhammad has lots of descendants today because of this. Anyway, <clears throat> um, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, their kids, their kids, the biblical patriarchs, I would expect them to have a lot of children. But the older they get, the more mutations their children have. And then as they start dying out, people don't live that long anymore. So the, in the early years after the flood, I expect some to be born with a high mutation load. That's all these branches in here and these branches in here. It's another reason to say the molecular clock doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. The length of the branch is the ancient parent, not time. It's not tens of thousands of years, it's one generation. Something else I did, uh, this I published just, just uh, last year in the Journal of Creation. You know the table of nations in Genesis chapter 11, right? This guy went there, this guy went there. Well, uh, that's Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 11 is called a chronogenealogy. It's a genealogy from Shem to Terah, who's the father of Abraham. Ten generations. And for each generation says how old the father is when his son is born. This is critical in us figuring out how the earth is, by the way. But besides that, you can graph that data, and it forms this beautiful biological decay curve. Now, a lot of you have seen this before in creation literature, but this is not the one you've seen before. Because I added here all the other people who are also mentioned in the Bible outside of Genesis chapter 11 who have an age and whose number of generations from Noah I know. Moses, Miriam, Aaron. Amran, Joseph, um, Joshua, um, uh, I, well, that's all these people in here. And they also fit the curve. So if someone says, oh, those numbers in Genesis are just made up, no way. Because no one in ancient history was drawing exponential decay curves. <laughs> that just wasn't part of their culture. No. And they wouldn't have thought, oh, 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 wait, 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 wait. Um, um, uh, Moses' father, Amran, is so many <laughs> generations removed from the flood, therefore he would have only lived this old and, and made sure he fit the curve. No. I've run experiments in biology where I expected a curve like that and got worse results than we see in the Bible. And all of the extraneous data, when you apply it, it fits the curve. This really looks like real information of real history. That's really cool. Okay. The seventh and final reason to believe in a biblical Adam. And the Bible says, 
you need to believe in the biblical Adam because he really did exist. Genesis chapter 2, the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into the mouth of the breath of life. The man became a living creature. And you can trace Adam's genealogy all the way through the scripture. All the way to Jesus, actually. But it's more than that. 1 Corinthians 15, 45. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Now, if that's the only two Bible verses I'm going to show you, most of you in this room are pretty familiar with the arguments. Um, basically, I want to stop now and, and kick off some question time. There is a lot in the Bible, theologically, telling us why Adam is important. Jesus being called the last Adam, that's critical. Jesus being the kinsman redeemer, I'm not Jewish. How can I be redeemed by a Jew? Well, it's because we're related through Adam. Yes. That curse that was passed on to me because I'm a descendant of Adam, Jesus, who was also a descendant of Adam, who didn't have that curse because he was sinless, he took that curse upon himself for me because I'm related to him through our mutual ancestor, Adam. I mean, on and on and on and on. You can go so many places with this. I'm going to leave it there. Let me give you a couple things that um, point you in a direction. Some of you are new to creation ministries, maybe new to the Bible, maybe new to Christianity, maybe you're not a Christian, I don't know. But if you're going to ask me a question, now, some people are going to ask me for recommendations. Here's my first recommendation for you. It's Creation Magazine. I told you earlier what it did for me. That's not a joke. This is very important in my own life. I still read this magazine, even though it's produced, and I sometimes I write articles in it. I still read it, because I still get good information out of it good, edifying, <coughs> encouraging things. Um, we have two ways, uh, two different things. You can get it for one year for $39 or two years for $50. It comes out quarterly, but for a two-year subscription, we're going to give you a copy of Darwin, The Voyage of Shook the World. This is the first movie CMI ever made. It's a one-hour documentary on the life of Charles Darwin. We did this in honor of his 200th birthday, the year 2009. Uh, we we're the first people to take a high-def camera from the Galapagos Island. We spent about a million dollars on this production. Wow. We want to do the best job we could. I'll give that to you with the magazine for two years. And I'm also going to throw in, uh, we call it Fallout. We took a TV camera to college campuses. And we interviewed several hundred college students. And we asked them these three questions. Were, did you go to church growing up? Uh, were you ever taught anything about Christian evolution? Do you still go to church? Those three questions open up a world of conversations. Wow! You can imagine what they said, but you don't have to imagine the capture on camera, and you can see it. And it was clear that students whose churches, whose families, who pastors preached from the pulpit, who dealt with these issues, were raising students who could stand in the breach in a very anti-Christian, hostile environment called college campus. Very interesting. So that's there. Um, you can do that now. Thank you. Okay. So I almost forgot. We're going to pass up the sign-up form because I'm going to have a volunteer helping me. I think it's Judy, right? Um, helping me at the table over there. But she can't explain this to five or ten people. So we'll just do it once for everybody. And I'll, as those go around the sign-up form, I'm just going to wrap up here. The next thing after Creation Magazine, that red book. Creation Answers book, we wrote it to answer 99% of the questions. A lot of questions you're about to ask me are answered in that book on purpose. That's why we wrote it. We have a pack called the Starter Pack. Um, out on the tables there is Mitochondria Lee and the Three Daughters of Noah. It's my first genetics talk I gave in front of 700 people. I said, <clears throat> Adam and Eve, Noah's Flood, and Tower of Babel actually happened, and the geneticists found it for us. I just threw the information out there. I gave this in front of couple hundred people also at one of our super conferences, the high tech cell. This is my favorite presentation I've ever given in my life. And I'm so glad we had a TV camera there. I'm claiming that the human genome is a computer operating system. But it's a hyper complex operating system that operates in four dimensions. Because it changes time. It changes shape in time, and it re dynamically recodes itself and rewrites itself over time. Oh, 
We don't write computers like that. We're not that smart. <laughs> but God was. God is, therefore he did. Uh, Evolution's Achilles Heels is um, three years of my life were poured into this. This is our most hard-hitting arguments that we could make. We interviewed nothing but PhD scientists who believe the Bible. Mm -hmm. And we said, Mr. Nerd, what can evolution not answer in your field of expertise? And then we had a bunch of non-nerds review it. <laughs> no, and we kept working, working, working until it made sense. And that's evolution's Achilles heels. Genetic entropy and mystery of the genome, my, my dear friend John Sanford. Uh, here's a, a former atheist, a former evolutionist who comes to Christ, comes to creation, and realizes that evolution is a house of cards. And this is a man that invented gene genetic engineering in plants. GMOs, that's him. I mean, very important guy in the world of science, very important guy in the world of creation. And that book is an eye-opening revelation of what the evolutionists actually believe. There's him in the middle there. There's me, Christopher Roop, my good friend. Um, Christopher put together a, um, a documentary called Dismantled. And for some kid coming out of the box, he did a great job. I think we have this on the tables. I'm not sure. Something definitely anyone can access the historical Adam. Similar to tonight, a little different, but it's free on creation.com. You click on our store and go to the, um, the media section. We have a streaming service, not like Netflix where you can watch everything, but it's just a little bit of money you can pay for each thing you want to watch. And the first thing we ever put up there was historical Adam, theological terms with scientific implications, which is what you're expecting tonight, but I changed it up on you. And I'm gonna leave you First Peter 3.15. In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that's in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. And that's the hard part, because my Irish temper flares up when people insult me. <laughs> but we're commanded. And you know what? Harsh and sarcastic facts shadow anger don't usually point people toward the kingdom of God. No. All right. Um. Okay, we'll um, take a few questions here. Uh, since we are live streaming and recording this, we're asking that you wait for the mic to answer, ask your questions. So raise your hand and I'll come around with the mic see if you can answer. So rules for questions, please. Um, I do not want to be tempted to contradict something this church teaches. I'm going to agree with most everything, but just in case, can we avoid doctrinal questions that separate denominations? End times theology, roles of men and women, Bible translations, just something else. I'll try to answer your question. Make sure your question is a question. Questions end in question marks. And please no long stories. I say that from experience. She's got the mic. In the back, somebody. So you talked about uh, one theory of being the multiple lines from the chimpanzee split, and you refuted that. Could you also use hybrid vigor to support your view that that's not true? I.e., if you were to breed an Ingus cow with a um, bull that was uh, uh, of a different breed, you would get hybrid vigor. So therefore, if you had uh, chromosome one breed with chromosome four, you could get hybrid vigor from that increases in genetic potential. I'm not exactly certain what you're asking, but let me explain to the audience what hybrid vigor is. For you just find it, let me redefine it again. Hearing it twice helps. Uh, when you have breeds, they tend to be sickly. Mutts aren't, because mutts are hybrids. You mix all the genes together, and you don't get recessive traits being expressed. It's a well-known thing in genetics called hybrid vigor. Um, I don't know what hybrid, how hybrid vigor applies here. I'm not sure what the question was. So if you had somebody from lineage A on your breakout graph. Yeah. If you had someone from lineage A on your breakout graph, and then you had someone from lineage E on the breakout graph, and they were to have progenal children, if they were from different branches on your graph on the right, you could expect hybrid vigor because they're not from the same branch, from the same ancestor. So as they're trying to separate this population, if people are hopping back and forth in the separating population, they actually be superior to the people that weren't. So it would be very difficult to get that happening. I guess that, that's the question? I don't know if I'm making a mistake, but I just did my best. 
let's move on and maybe in a minute I'll be like, oh yeah, and I have something more to say. Right at the moment I don't. By the way, this is stump the chump time, um, and I don't mind not knowing answers to questions. It's actually kind of fun. Sir. Yes, you were, you were talking about uh, the most recent mutations, mutations that can cause us harm, like uh, the hemophiliac you were talking about. Are these mutations because of the fall into sin, or do you have a, some kind of a scientific explanation for that? Okay, um, interesting question. I wrote an article series last summer called Species Were Designed to Change. Three-part articles on creation.com. I don't remember where, I think it's the second part, I'm not sure, but in there I said that God might have written parts of the genome to be mutated at random over time. So when he's coding the genome, he's like, well, you know, I know that C's turn to T's more frequently because water attacks the C and it mutates it. That's just chemistry, right? So I'll put a G there instead. Then now it can't mutate. Oh, no, I want it to mutate. I'll put a C there. So God could have put the potential for change into genomes by the way he coded it. And one of the, the genes that changes the most is skin color genes. We see the same skin color variants happening in people, dogs, horses, rabbits. Same color changes. Now, we are one color. A lot of animals have different colors because they have a slightly different system of, of generating the color. But still, of our colors, I mean, it's the same mutation, the same type of gene in a rabbit and a human. So the new mutations, some of them could have been allowed for in the creation model, even if we hadn't fallen under corruption. But anything that's like blindness or something like that, clearly that's a bad mutation. Most changes, though, I don't know how what frequency of bad mutations or good mutations is, and no one can actually say that. I think most mutations actually end up with a dead embryo, and so we never see them. All we see is mutations that are survivable, and so that might be a big filter. I, I can't I can't answer the question. Wow, that's two questions in a row. Good job, guys. <laughs> Batting a thousand here. Oh, I, I was yeah. watching a documentary about uh, Genghis Khan a couple years ago. Yes, haplotype C, by the way. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, anyway, in that because he conquered so much land, they said that was, well, of course he lived in about the 1200s. But because he conquered so much land, every one in 200 men alive today is a descendant of his. Is that possible? Um, Genghis Khan raped and murdered his way across Asia. His sons did it, his grandsons did it. I think one of his grandsons became uh, emperor of China mm -hmm. when the Mongols conquered China. Uh, their policy was kill the guys and keep the woman in your harem. Okay, so it's possible. It, yes. Okay. And his descendants don't live all over the world. Yeah. But because there's so many people in East Asia and such a high frequency of them uh, look like they're descended from Genghis Khan, it's about one out of 200. Okay, but did, why did they only mention the men and not the women? Uh, because we measure that with the Y chromosome. Okay. They ha those he and his sons and grandsons yeah. had lots of women, so lots of mitochondrial lineages yeah. are amongst their descendants. Okay, so they're mostly in Asia. Mostly in Asia. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you. By the way, that's a brilliant evolutionary strategy. Kill all, kill off so everybody, keep the there. girls for yourself. That is a brilliant evolutionary strategy. No evolutionist says morally wrong. Works. Sir. Thanks, Dr. Carter, a lot for coming out tonight. Uh, the question that I have is um, if I remember correctly, in Dr. Sanford's book, um, he actually, by specifying mutations, proved that evolution was also wrong from the standpoint that if it did take hundreds of thousands of years for humans to develop to where we are right now, and during that entire period of time, negative mutations would have occurred all along that line. You know, we would be like cell, you know, blobs sitting in the corner like jello. You would be Sanford. Yeah. Uh, Sanford's thesis <laughs> is called genetic entropy. Yes. Now, you can't apply entropy to the genomes because natural selection removes all those bad mutations. No, it doesn't. Or does it? And that was his question. 
most mutations are invisible to natural selection. Because natural selection, by definition, <coughs> if a, a variant affects reproductive output, that's naturally selectable. If it doesn't, natural selection doesn't care. Most mutations, I mean, I've, I, I have 100 mutations that my dad and mom weren't born with that I was born with. And I picked up more. I'm, I think at 50 years old, I'm 53 now, I think at 50 years old, uh, the average skin cell is 60,000 mutations. Mm -hmm. Well, that's just a, a model of the population over time. Because even if our reproductive cells don't go through as many generations as skin, they still go through re, uh, recombination and uh, cell division. And every cell division, more mutations. And if mutations can't be removed, if the analogy I like to use is a car. A mutation is like a speck of rust. Mm -hmm. One speck of rust does nothing. But eventually that car is going to be completely falling apart because of the accumulation of many little specks. <coughs> And you can't say, oh, that car has 102 specs. I'm not going to buy it. Oh, it has 99. Okay, I can buy it. That's, that's natural selection. It's going to be passed on or not. Um, it's not the way things work. So we're literally rusting out as a species. Right. Okay. And if, if, I, if I understood him correctly, the amount of mutations that have taken place can be counted. Mm -hmm. And the amount of mutations that exist now actually is equal to around the 4,500 mark as the beginning of it. If you look at the or 6,000 if you want to take it back to Adam. If you look at the Y chromosome, if you look at the uh, mitochondrial genome, the number of mutations we see is commensurate, is that the right word, with a just a few thousand year old genome for those things. Right. The rest of the genome, like our nuclear genome, doesn't quite count because um, there's millions upon millions of variants that don't cause disease. And I said earlier, there's a God-created variants. Mm -hmm. But because only one Y and one mitochondria, they're, by definition, we have a starting point for those. Right. Okay. okay, we're going to take one more question, and then uh, we're going to stop there. And uh, you can talk to Dr. Carter after the uh, uh, Meeting's over if you'd like, but we want to give people an opportunity to take off if they want to. So, one more question. I'm thinking that a more basic question for evolutionists is this. How could the ability to reproduce have evolved before the ability to reproduce existed? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent question. We have a track we made a couple years, uh, 10 years or so ago called 15 questions for evolutionists. The evolutionists were very angry at this, and so they made entire websites, 15 answers for creationists. <laughs> well, okay then. So we, well, we took their answers, and we put them on our website, and they, had, they tried to answer those. We took those, and we answered them too. It's a very powerful argument we have on our website. And the origin of sexual reproduction, you, th you just actually reproduction in general, but the origin of sexual reproduction it's incredibly, it, it's a total mystery. Why would that ever, ever, ever arrive? Half your population is a waste? Yeah. Why, why? Yeah, there are benefits to sexual reproduction, but you don't know the benefits before the, the system evolves. When you consider the mechanics of yeah. the parts needed in separately in the male and the female, yeah. why would they bother to evolve? The same reason, why would, why would metamorphosis in a butterfly ever evolve. Yes, exactly. Caterpillars are perfectly functional. A lot yeah. of worm-like things in the world that don't go through metamorphosis. Yeah. Why on earth would you have your insides turned to jelly where you actually have no cells? You melt down on the inside and a couple little cells, they start reorganizing everything to the point where your legs as a caterpillar are not the same thing as your legs or your eyeballs or your antenna or anything in the butterfly. So, so where, where, where in the world would that selection come from to be, in, you know, to be something that could be selected for. Yes, and every step of the process has to be advantageous. Exactly. But it's nothing's advantageous until it works. It's a chicken and egg problem that yeah. we see all over the place in biology. It doesn't work. Uh, in fact, our origin of life has the most chicken and egg problems, and they're multi um, multiplicative. 
you get three and four and five way chicken and egg problems is when you're talking about the origin of life. Because yeah. you need this and that and that and that to make this. Oh, but that needs that because that makes this over here. Oh. <laughs> yeah. All right. Genesis let's, just let's said it was <laughs> I just have a few announcements. I'll try to get through them pretty quickly so that um, we can get on to refreshments and looking at materials and talking to Dr. Carter if we'd like to. So try to hurry up. Okay, so I just want to mention again, I know I mention it every month, but it's, our overtures are so important. And so I want you again to please think about uh, these overtures, and please try to influence your delegates to the district convention. The district convention will be in June. Um, please try to influence your delegates to vote for these overtures. I won't say any more about that. There are copies of the overtures out on the uh, literature table out in the hallway, and you can pick those up. And also there are little pamphlets that explain uh, the reasons behind these overtures. Okay, next month we have uh, Mr. Carl Kirby. Uh, coming in, He'll, uh, he's a, a very famous speaker in the, in the creation world. Um, he's been speaking for over 20 years. Um, he'll be talking, you know, talk, the topic of his talk will be answering skeptics, reacteria, I think is how he's pronouncing that, uh, but it'll be an apologetic talk, so it, it, it will be more apologetic than uh, technical as, as this one has been today. Um, this will be at Epiphany Lutheran Church in Castle Rock, so we hope to see you then, 7 o'clock on Thursday, May 5th. And then the other um, big announcement we have coming up about the creation conference that's coming up, and that's Friday and Saturday, April 22nd and 23rd. Um, we are partnering with the Institute for Creation Research to put on this conference. Uh, we have three speakers coming in. Dr. Randy Galusa, who's the president of ICR, uh, Dr. Tim Clary, a geologist, and Dr. Brian Thomas, who specializes in uh, dinosaurs and uh, and I believe he's a biotechnologist or something like that. I might not have that quite right. That's at Shepherd of the Hills Lutheran Church. Uh, tickets are $25 for adults, uh, $15 for students. And if you'd like more information, you can go to Denver Society Creation uh, Special Events and you'll find it there. Uh, we also have, uh, there, there are flyers and there are postcards out on the literature table. So please take as many of them as you'd like, spread them out to your friends, they make great birthday presents, you know, just um, get them distributed so that we can try to have as many people as possible at, at this conference. Um, just a little bit of information about the talks. Dr. Galusa is going to be giving two talks. First one is great answers to three key questions about origins. And the second is about the theory that he's been, develop been developing called continuous environmental tracking. Um, Tim Clary will be talking about the truth of the general Genesis flood, and I think his work in geology has been very interesting. Uh, he worked with Chevron for many years and used the data from their oil wells to map how the continents may have moved during the flood. And so I think you'll find that very interesting. And then also, do dinosaurs support evolutionary theory? And Dr. Thomas will be talking about Adam, not apes, and why the world looks so young. So I think it's going to be a great conference, and I hope all of you can come. Uh, sign up soon uh, and get your tickets. So, and I can I can do that for you tonight if you'd like, uh, or we or you can go online. It's probably easiest to go online, but if you're uncomfortable with going online, see me afterwards and I'll make sure you get a ticket. Okay, if you like Dr. Carter's talk tonight, uh, you can also see him tomorrow night at the Rocky Mountain Creation Fellowship. Uh, he'll be speaking there tomorrow night at eight o'clock on ancient DNA in the Bible. And they will also have Zoom and live stream, stream sessions available. So you can find that on their website, which is youngearth.org. And then the Pikes Peak Creation Fellowship will host Dr. Carter on Saturday, April 9th at 1 o'clock. Again, ancient DNA in the Bible, so if you can't make Friday night, maybe you can make Saturday night in Colorado Springs. That's at Faith Evangelical Free Church uh, in Colorado Springs. And then just some reminders, we have a mailing list out there. Please sign up if you'd like to get our emails. And there are also business cards, there are brochures, there are conference flyers, there are postcards. So please pick up that stuff and, and help us out and distribute that as much as you can. Uh, we're 501c3, so your donations are deductible. Um, you can go to our website, you can, uh, you can donate by mail, or there's a donation box on the welcome.
Okay, so we'll close uh, with the Lord's Prayer, and then we'll sing the hymn, Almighty God, your word is cast. So if you could please stand, we'll go ahead and start with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. We'll do the hymn here. Uh, we'll play it through once so you can get the tune in case you're not familiar with it. <clears throat>